All right, so I'll go back to the start. I think I'll just manually uh, do that. Fantastic. All right, so now you can you can see me. Can I can you? see you. Okay. All and right. I see the penguin with the egg and the broken ice. Yes. Okay. Great. 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 So when I go like this, yeah, it shines on there. I'm just trying to because of the the two screens, which is actually three screens. Yeah. Although, because there's one big one and you and I are off to the side there. And then um, anyway, so yeah. So when I, I look up like this, am I looking at you? You are. Okay, Perfect. good. Okay, because when I just look over to my picture and to you, I'm you're looking not. to the side. Yeah, so yeah, I'll just yeah. try to look at the camera. All right, I think, I think we're set. <laughs> yeah barring power outages and the like. So if you need to communicate with me, uh, so um, I, we're gonna start to talk fairly soon. I'd like everyone who's not France or myself to please mute their microphones. Um, I'd also like everyone to know that with France's permission, we're recording this talk and it should be available by Zoom through Montana Tech's digital comments site on our library within probably a few days or a week. Um, so if you have friends who missed the talk, they should be able to watch it on their, on their own time anytime they like. Uh, the second thing I'm going to ask is if you are not watching alone, if you could please, uh, through the chat um, feature, send to Victoria Pagan and only Victoria Pagan, that's P-A-G-A-N, she's up at the top as one of the hosts, uh, please send her a little number that says how many people, including yourself, are watching from your connection. Um, because as you'll see, we do have a few sponsors and they like to know how many are there. And if we're all together in a room, I can count noses. But if we're all connecting by Zoom, we can only count the quote participants, which um, in many participants oh, might be 10 participants there instead of just being one, and frequently two. <laughs> So, um, if, if everybody who does is not the speaker or me could please mute their microphones, that would be a big help. Thank you. So, so thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the fifth talk in Montana Tech's Spring 2021 Public Lecture Series. I'm Beverly Karplis Hartline, the Vice Chancellor for Research and Dean of the Graduate School at Montana Technological University. Today's talk is co-sponsored by Montana's NSF EPSCOR funded Consortium for Research on Environmental Water Systems, or CRUISE, and Montana's NIH funded Embry Project, which invests in building biomedical research capacity across the state. It's a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Dr. Franz Cordova and to welcome her virtually to Butte, Montana, where we have a great snowpack and the low tonight is headed toward minus 26 C or about minus 15 F, colder than McMurdo Station, but not quite as cold as South Pole. So Franz, you'd feel quite at home. Uh, Dr. Cordova earned her bachelor's degree in English from Stanford and her PhD in physics from Caltech. As an undergrad, like many Montana Tech undergrads, she did field research on the Zapotec Pueblo in Oaxaca, Mexico. Her career has taken her to Los Alamos National Laboratory 
and Pennsylvania State University, followed by a stint as the chief scientist of NASA, I think the first female chief scientist of NASA. After serving as professor, uh, and please turn off your microphones, um, a, a professor of physics and vice chancellor for research at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She became the chancellor of UC Riverside and, and laid some of the groundwork for establishing the School of Medicine there. Following Riverside, she headed east and served as president of Purdue University, where she was a champion for student success, interdisciplinary research, and uh, economic commercialization of research results. Her more recent government service includes being on the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution and serving as the 14th Director of the National Science Foundation from 2014 to 2020. Dr. Cordova's major research interests include observational experimental astrophysics, research on gamma ray sources, and spaceborne instrumentation, and she has been in Antarctica four times with even having a nunatak or rocky outcrop na there named for her. The seminar, fl the seminar flyer for this uh, public lecture was so stunning that our local Butte newspaper used it three times in last Friday's paper, including on the top of the front page, which helped publicize the talk. Thank you, Montana Standard. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cordova virtually to Montana Technological University and Butte to let us know about the best journey in the world, a quarter century of research travels to Antarctica. Thank you very much, Beverly, for that really nice introduction and hello everyone. So uh, can you hear my voice? Fine, and all that works great, great. Well, hello. I'd like to welcome you all on what I believe is the best journey in the world. Although, as you'll uh, see, it was not the best journey for everyone. On this slide is a photo of the melting sea ice, which will gradually change our world as we know it. And a photo taken by a colleague of the egg of an emperor penguin whose allure attracted a young zoologist to join Scott's fated expedition in 1910. And I'm going to touch on both of these themes that is of science and exploration in my talk. As you'll see, Antarctica is a uniquely attractive and important place to explore science. So first, what does this trip today look like? Here's an outline of my talk. First, I'll set the stage. I'll give some background on Antarctica, talk a little bit about the books that have been written about it that have really impressed me, that teach us about the history of Antarctic exploration. I'll talk about Antarctica itself, its size, geology, its unique environmental conditions. And yes, today it's met McMurdo. It's about the same temperature as it is in Butte, Montana. You're right, Ben. I'll talk about who, quote, owns Antarctica and how it's divvied up among nations and the important Antarctic treaty system as a worldwide consensus. So that will set the stage. Um, and then I'll, I'll go into the substance of my four trips to Antarctica, which spanned a quarter of a century. And uh, what I'll do is give you 10 highlights of my personal best of, uh, of Antarctica, which combines all those four, four trips. Just what, what I liked that really impressed me about Antarctica, I wanna share that with you. And then I'll talk about science um, and science policy imperatives for the continent. And finally, how you can get to Antarctica. So first, the uh, exploration of Antarctica. I have both of these books. These are two book covers. I have them both on my Kindle. And I read them while on long flights to Antarctica. And it, those flights were very, very long. The worst journey in the world is about Robert Falcon Scott's ill-fated journey to Antarctica starting in 1910. And it was written by 
Apsley Cherry Gerard. He was on that expedition and he wrote the book about a decade later. So obviously he survived it. And it's really uh, a, a, a gripping book. It's if you Google the 10 best travel books of all time, this will inevitably come up on every uh, writer, author, readers list. And on some, it comes out right at the top. It's, it's a, a, an amazing book because it's so honest about what they went through during the three years that this expedition was in Antarctica. And Cherry uh, Gerard was the young zoologist that I mentioned, and he was brought on board in order to, um, to, to, to try to verify a theory called the recapitulation theory at the time about uh, embryonic eggs, uh, which could be clues to the link between uh, the evolutionary link between reptiles and birds. Um, and so, so the goal, his goal, was to bring back the um, eggs of the emperor penguin and uh, study them with his fellow researchers in the United Kingdom. He was the youngest member of the trip. He was in his early 20s at the time. So when, when he says the worst journey in the world, that the book is actually in two parts. The first part is about his journey with a couple others in the expedition, including Scott's second in command, Robert Wilson, uh, to, to find the nesting place of the emperor penguin. And I'll say a little bit more about that later, what their journey looked like. And they because the penguins, those penguins nest in the, the dark, dark of winter, they had to do that expedition completely uh, in the dark for several months. And that is what he, what gave rise to the title of the book, what he called the worst journey in the world. The second part, the part that everybody remembers most about this book, it's not the, the quest for science, the science goal, but uh, was Scott's own journey with some of the men in the expedition to the South Pole. Now, uh, Cherry uh, was, as he was called by his uh, uh, compatriots, was not uh, invited to go to the South Pole. He was asked to stay behind it at uh, Cape uh, Evans and uh, with the, of several others. And Scott took uh, Wilson, who had gone on the quote, worst journey with him to the pole. And as we know, um, they, they reached the pole, albeit a month after Amundsen's expedition, and they never made it back. And so when they realized that it was getting, when Cherry and his um, uh, fellows at Cape Evans realized that, um, you know, time was up and where was Scott and his men, it was really the end of the uh, Antarctic summer. And so they couldn't go out and look for them. So they had to hole over for another whole winter at Cape Evans. And then they went out the next summer uh, to look for them. And indeed they found them frozen in their tents. And so he writes about all that. And um, I'll end my talk concluding with uh, some of his observations. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Shackleton's expedition, which this book Endurance is all about, was um, really the ultimate, ultimate tale of deprivation. It was his expedition was uh, just right after Scott's expedition was 1914 to 1917. And amazingly, uh, nobody died, although you, you expected them to die any time because they had horrendous adventures. Uh, both of these books recount adventures of desperation, but also real uh, resilience and hopes, and I, I commend them. So a little bit about Antarctic history. Um, the, all of these drawings, first of all, are from or these uh, images. They, they are uh, the photos of the time were made during the Amundsen uh, expedition. And I think they're just really interesting. The existence of Antarctica was only a hypothesis until it was first cited in 1820 by Thaddeus Bellinghausen. James Clark Ross brought his ships which were called the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror, and remember those names because they figured a little later on, to an island area that now bears his name, Ross Island. No one set foot on the continent until 1895, and who that person was is kind of lost in history. 
1900 to 1960, 16 is called the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. So as I mentioned, the South Pole was first reached by Amundsen's team from Norway and a month later by Scott's party. The first geophysical year, international geophysical year was in 1957-58. And that was a really important, important time. It was the start of the US Antarctic program and NSF National Science Foundation was tasked to be its steward and continues that uh, mission uh, on behalf of the nation. And at that time, 12 nations built more than 60 research stations on the continent and vowed to cooperate for peaceful scientific purposes. And so hence, today we have the An uh, Antarctic Treaty, which is signed by some 54 uh, countries and it's dedicated to peaceful um, purposes, including research and uh, research of the environment, the surrounding oceans at all, and uh, no um, uh, corporate or investment uh, types of activities, no uh, nuclear um, uh, explorations of, uh, uh, you know, using uh, nuclear weapons or military weapons of any kind there. So it's all about uh, establishing the continent as, uh, as a ground for uh, peaceful uh, purposes and international cooperation. So how big is Antarctica? It's about the size of the US plus Mexico. And here's an overlay of the US on it. And uh, McMurdo, which I'll take you to in a minute, which is where the US has one of its three stations is right here in South Texas. The South Pole is up here, approximately where Kansas and Nebraska and Colorado meet right in that area. Um, the the uh, famous um, uh, Sentinel Mountain Range where the highest mountain, Mount Vince, Vinson uh, is in Antarctica is right here in, uh, in Idaho. And uh, I think some of you have heard of Lake Vostok that's in the Midwest over here. And this, this part is called uh, Eastern Antarctica. It's uh, its own kind of ice sheet and um, a geological environment. And the Western ice sheet is right here. And that's where the National Science Foundation and others have most of their field sites. So there, there are field sites all over the continent. And the famous peninsula is here, which kind of looks over at South America. So by convention, north is up and east is to the right. And so if you go in a southern line along a line of latitude, a longitude here, you'll hit New Zealand, which is where the United States has its depot, its um, organizing headquarters for flights into McMurdo and then on to the South Pole. More than 170 million years ago, Antarctica was part of the supercontinent Gondwana in its present shape uh, took place about 35 to 25 billion years ago. All right, there are about 70 research stations. You can see all the little red things around uh, in Antarctica. They represent 29 countries and there are just dozens of uh, field camps not shown here. So the US again is uh, here at McMurdo on the Rice, uh, Ross ice shelf. Uh, the US has the only station at the South Pole called the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. And the US has Palmer uh, Station up here, um, which is on the, on the peninsula. So those are the three US stations. But you see there are many, many stations around here. The peninsula is the most visited by, by tourists. It's the easiest to get to. Uh, you can take a boat across the Drake Passage here, or you can even fly from Punta Arenas in, uh, in Chile uh, onto the peninsula. But um, just mostly researchers uh, go uh, to the rest of the continent. So the geology of Antarctica is just fascinating. And I'll just say a couple of things about it. Um, and then when you see uh, photos of particular research camps, you'll see other geology coming to the fore. Uh, part of the unique geology is, of course, the ice, which covers the land mass. It's on average 1.2 miles thick, but in some places it's more than two miles thick, like over uh, Lake Vostok, shown here. 
there's it's a continent with a lot of subglacial lakes and rivers. It was, as I said, formed by tectonics. So there are many different, um, you know, former continents which merged and are part of Antarctica now. Um, and so volcanism and earthquakes are an important part of um, what's formed Antarctica. And I'll show you a little bit more about that as we travel. So here's a, a very uh, interesting um, um, map, and uh, it's an animation by Murdoch et al. in Earth Sciences Reviews. And this just came out this week in the New York Times. And so I wanted to show it here. It shows how um, the, the, the tectonics of how the continents over 1 billion years, so you see this is a thousand million years ago, a billion years, the last billion years, um, how the uh, continents on our planet took shape. And let me, whoops, the wrong button here. Let me see if I can start this here. Yes. So th this is kind of a, a fascinating map for uh, geologists, well, for all of us. And I, I really commend this article. It has a lot of detail, goes through the whole 1 billion years. The different colored lines show rifting and subduction zones, mid-ocean ridges and transform boundaries. Um, but it's, it's kind of amazing to show how our earth has changed over the last billion years. And you see Antarctica uh, forming down there um, at the bottom. So you can get this animation by going to this article. So um, let's go now to uh, the, the biggest of the bases in Antarctica, which is McMurdo that the US runs and the National Science Foundation is a steward for. It's, um, as I said, one of the US's three stations in the continent. It was established uh, a, a, about 1955, but really came into prominence um, after the US geophysical year. Um, access to it is by airplanes that have skis on them. Uh, usually, although there is one place where you can actually land with wheels if the ice is hard enough near McMurdo and by ships. Uh, the US has one uh, big uh, deep ice breaker called the US Polar Star, and that breaks ice annually for the smaller research vessels that bring researchers and all sorts of supplies to McMurdo. So McMurdo Station is up here. This whole thing is Ross, Ross Island here. And all along the coast here are famous camps uh, at, at various capes that I will take you to that were the, the depots for Shackleton and um, uh, and Scott and, uh, and others through the heroic age. The summer population at McMurdo up here is about uh, 1,000 to sometimes 1,200. Uh, the winter population is only a couple of hundred. Most of the people there are support staff for the 200 to 300 scientists who do the summer research. The latitude of McMurdo is 78 degrees south. And the uh, longitude, as I mentioned, is approximately that of New Zealand. McMurdo is accessed from Christchurch, New Zealand, mostly using LC-130 planes flown by the US Air Force. And I'll show you an example of that later, talk a little bit about the Air Force's efforts. Ross Island is attached to the continent by an ice sheet Mount Erebus and Mount Terror are prominent features on this island. You re may remember they were the names of the, the ships in Captain Ross's fleet. So Mount Erebus, which I'll uh, take you on a little uh, trip to in a, in a bit, is um, the world's southernmost active volcano. And you can always see something uh, spewing some, uh, some clouds from the, the hot gases in the crater of Mount Erebus. Its elevation is 12,500 feet. So the entire Ross Island is made up of volcanoes, very unusual kind of feature. Marble Point over here is um, a service depot for what's called the dry valleys. So those are rocky places 
in um, in Antarctica. If you look at the overall map, they're right right down here uh, in the south. And th there's a lot of field camps there, and we'll go to some of those field camps as well. I'll show you what they look like. Um, there. It's accessed by helicopters that go out of McMurdo and then to the various camps and to the main uh, heliport at Marble Point. So, um, so Antarctica is always um, about three things, the cold, the wind, and the dryness of it. That's what really distinguishes it. So I just have a, a few numbers here, which I hope will interest you for McMurdo Station, which as I said, is at minus 78, and the South Pole Station, of course, at um, minus 90. And you see that only the hottest month do they share in common, but the coldest month is a little different, the wettest month, the windiest month. And the annual precipitation is very low. Although I think this year, Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I am right now, really rivaled that um, because we didn't have any rain this whole year either. So very cold, windy, and dry place. So uh, the Antarctic Treaty and related agreements collectively known as the Antarctic Treaty System regulate international relations with respect to Antarctica. It's defined by all of the land and ice shelves south of 60 degrees latitude. The treaty entered into force in 1961. And as I said, there are 54 parties to the treaty as of 2019, uh, 29 voting members. And it is very clear that the continent should only be used for peaceful scientific purposes and prohibits military activity. It's nominally enforced to 2048. Um, there's a lot of activity, as you can imagine, a lot of conferences and meetings um, to re-up uh, the treaty. Every year there are discussions and negotiations about it. But right now, thankfully, there's a real commitment to hold to the original purposes of the treaty. You may notice that the US is not one of these colorful wedges here. The US has a basis for a claim, but it doesn't claim any part of the continent. All right, so now my four trips to Antarctica, which spanned a quarter of a century. And so this is just one picture from each one. Uh, I first went there in January of 1996. Those who were um, alive and active in government may remember that famous time. Uh, it was during a, a very long government furlough um, and uh, President Clinton was in office at the time. And so NSF sponsors every once in a while, every few years, a VIP trip. And so they had one organized for this time, but many of the heads of agencies because of the furlough decided not to go. So the head of NASA asked me as being the chief scientist if I would like to go. And especially because we did have a mission there which was to review the South Pole Station. And I understand Beverly Hartline here was also involved in um, looking over the um, requirements for a new uh, South Pole Station refurbished station because the old one was falling apart, being covered by um, ice and snow. And so, um, so I went there and the only other um, quote VIP that went with me was Harold Barmas, who was head of the National Institutes of Health at the time. And, um, and Harold and I um, had a similar sense for adventure. And as you'll see, we got out and about uh, during this trip, but it was very, um, uh, important to go there and to document why we needed a new South Pole Station. So that was something that the National Science and Technology Council undertook. Um, we all wrote a report uh, when we got back with, with others and submitted it to the Senate. So you'll see that this looks very different. We didn't have iPhones in 1996. So I had, uh, I made my last scrapbook. This is actually a nice scrapbook. And there's a picture of the old South Pole Station on it with me standing in front. And so the pictures I will show you that are interspersed with other um, photos from my phone are, um, are all from that scrapbook. So in, I, in 2012, I went there as a member of the National Science Board. The two people with me are Arnie Stansell and um, uh, uh, Carl Leinberger, who are uh, also members of the National Science Board. 
And every year, uh, members of that board, a few of them, uh, go down to uh, Antarctica. It's a real, real treat. And but they they have work to do. They're supposed to be reviewing what the NSF is doing there. Then in 2014, I hosted a congressional delegation. The short term for that is CODEL. Um, and it had uh, 10, 10 congressmen under the leadership of the head of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee, Lamar Smith. And it was composed of both uh, Republican and Democratic uh, congressmen and women. And I was looking up uh, where are they now, uh, these 10. And uh, five of them are still in Congress, and five uh, are retired. Uh, one of those is in jail. Then in 2019, December, so it was just over a year ago, um, I hosted a VIP trip of my own of the heads of various uh, science agencies um, to, uh, to Antarctica. It's a really uh, special time. Little did we know what was coming down the pipe, namely. Uh, COVID. So it was very uh, special looking back that we got to go. So accompanying me were the DOE undersecretary, the head of the USGS, the head of NOAA, the head of NIST, the White House chief technology officer, and the NSF chief staff. So the 10 highlights that I'm going to show you are from uh, these four trips. So the first highlight is um, just Antarctica itself. It's, um, I, I titled this slide Crystal Desert. That's actually the title of a book by David Campbell that I really recommend uh, if you uh, get the opportunity to go to Antarctica. It's a lyrical book, just, just beautiful. This is as close to being on another planet as we'll ever experience here on planet Earth. NASA does a number of exercises in Antarctica to prepare astronauts and robotic rovers for exploring other bodies like the moon and Mars. You feel alone in this vast sea of ice. I want to give you a quote from David Campbell's book. He said, Antarctica seemed to be a prebiotic place as the world must have looked before the broth of life bubbled and popped into whales and tropical forests and humans. I was as lonely as an astronaut walking on the moon. My second highlight are the flights to Antarctica and the pole. One of the best parts of the trips are the long flights in the four engine turboprop LC-130 airplanes, which are equipped with skis. These cargo aircraft are flown for the National Science Foundation by the New York Air National Guard's 109th airlift wing based in Schenectady, New York, uh, since uh, 1999. Before that, the Navy handled the logistics for the US Antarctic program for 44 years. But it's just great to work with the, uh, with the Air Force there. They are they're everywhere. They're not just on the flights. Here, here you see the inside of a cargo plane. And believe me, we feel like cargo. We're just strapped to the sides of the plane. And all the important stuff is in the middle, all in uh, you know, boxes, all really tied down. And we have to wear, this is right before takeoff, because we when you land, you have to be in your full garb. And um, and we, we have to wear these giant headphones because it's so noisy. So you see here are two congressmen. One is sleeping and one is on his iPad. And those are the two things one do does on this airplane, unless you're me, where you scramble towards one of the windows and you're, you're looking out at, uh, at the scenery uh, as you start approaching uh, the mainland. Uh, so here's uh, an example of an LC-130 airplane with the congressman from that trip um, in 2014, all standing in front of it, uh, getting ready to get on it. So the, um, the views uh, there are just, uh, just amazing. And I'll, I'll mention uh, later on one of the very um, special uh, views that I got to see. Um, the next um, feature, number three, is McMurdo Station itself. McMurdo is a, a hodgepodge of a town. It's like an old mining town. And um, so much so, it's 
getting uh, kind of a decrepit looking in its old age, that a couple of years ago, Congress approved a half billion dollar upgrade to consolidate operations and improve logistics and make scientific research there um, supported more efficiently. And this was all a result of a, a team of people led by Norm Augustine, who went down there, a Blue Ribbon Committee, to that uh, NSF asked to review uh, how good the station was at supporting science. They came back with a lot of recommendations. So fortunately, we, uh, you know, petitioned with Congress over a number of years, and they did approve that support. And that effort is going on now, likely being delayed in part owing to the pandemic. The town is full of specialized vehicles that can maneuver in this very harsh environment. And here's an example of one of them. Uh, Ivan the Terabus, uh, it, it, this one carries passengers which land at the airfield that is some uh, 14 miles away from McMurdo and takes us when we land uh, to McMurdo. Um, supporting the upkeep of the vehicles, which have to be very hardy for this harsh environment, really requires a lot of staff. Um, there's uh, all kinds of trucks, there's helicopters, I'll show you in a minute. There's a giant caravan of vehicles with belts and large tires that takes supplies across the so-called McMurdo South Pole Highway, which is more than 900 miles long by land. And so all of that requires a lot of um, a lot of staff, a lot of upkeep. Most of these people are very young people having the adventure of their lives. And one is shown here. Uh, many are women. And here are her hands. Um, and um, they're full of oil and grit, as you can see. But she's wearing green nail polish. And so I asked, I said, Oh, goodness, uh, you know, where's the nail salon? And she said, Oh, we, you know, we import the, the polish on, you know, flights or, or, or uh, ships. And then we take turns uh, polishing each other's nails. So I thought that was impressive. So uh, there's lots to do for fun around McMurdo. Hiking up Observation Hill, which you can do even at midnight in the, the summer, since it's daylight for 24 hours, is a, a favorite uh, pastime. And I've done that on every one of my trips. Um, it's in, in good weather, it's, it's fine. In terrible weather, I thought I'd die. It's, it's steep and sometimes quite icy, which uh, just adds to the scary factor. Um, we've, uh, this, I, I promised you some pictures from Harold Varmus and my trip. Here we are ice fishing, which is uh, uh, a favorite pastime. You capture some uh, really weird critters that don't look anything like the trout you catch here in New Mexico. Uh, we have skied on the um, Ross Ice Shelf, cross-country skied, which is just great, wonderful experience. We've uh, hiked up Castle Rock here, which is, this is a picture by Josh uh, Swanson of the US Antarctica program. There's more than one bar in uh, uh, McMurdo, although I haven't been to any of them. I'm, I'm not sure why, they just try to keep me out. Uh, there's a nicely equipped gym called the Big Gym. And of course, a giant cafeteria where the favorite food is uh, ice cream. This is the cross, which uh, Scott's party, the ones who were alive at the end of the expedition, dragged up Observation Hill, it's on the top of this hill, and uh, in honor of Scott and his uh, colleagues who perished with him. And so it's really kind of special to be there um, now, um, just over a, a hundred years since they had that famous expedition. So um, NASA has a long duration balloon facility near McMurdo. It's several miles away. And so um, we go carefully in these big vehicles. Every year that I've been there, I insist we drive out to it because I really enjoy meeting the faculty and the staff who put together the payloads for the balloon flights, mostly looking at cosmic rays, neutrinos, upper atmospheric phenomena, cosmic microwave background. Here I'm showing astronaut John Grunsfeld, who was on the uh, trip with the congressman 
uh, I invited him to join. He was um, uh, a, a chief scientist for NASA at that time and Congressman David Schweikert from Arizona, they're examining one of the payloads. I've been lucky enough to see a couple of the balloons take off. That's usually in December time. Another site to visit near McMurdo is the Kiwi Station, New Zealand Station. They're, they're very close, just uh, a few kilometers uh, from McMurdo and you can see some Kiwi art here. Uh, it's all decorated in, in the, the green. Um, and uh, they they have a very a small station compared to McMurdo, but they're a lot of fun. They there's a lot of travel of the staff back and forth between the two facilities. So my number fourth highlight is Mount Erebus. Uh, so as you saw, that's the prominent feature on Ross Island, and I mentioned that it was the southernmost continuously active volcano, uh, named by Ross in 1841 after one of the ships. The members of Shackleton's expedition made the summit in 1908. So yes, it has been summited and now many times. On my first trip, we flew right over the summit and you could see the lava lake in the caldera. And this shows what flying over it. And this is from my scrapbook. Um, nowadays, the pilots are not authorized to do that. So it was lucky. NSF and NASA funded research like volcanology and astrobiology is conducted on the slopes and in and near the crater, um, mostly with robots. And whenever people go up here, it's always with mountaineering guides. I've been pleased to meet a number of guides. It's, it's interesting, they're always young people and they usually, they're in the other winter season, they're in North America leading guided trips up mountain, you know, the famous mountain peaks um, in, uh, in North America. Mount Erebus is classified as a polygenetic stratovolcano. The bottom half is a shield and the top half is a stratocone. Okay, my fifth highlight is the, uh, the dry, dry valleys, the most dramatic parts of my trips, because you can see the, the most geology, have been the helicopter explorations of the dry valleys to the east of Ross Island. Uh, there's, this is where most of the summer field camps are and just stunning geology. We made several landings. Here's uh, one of the helicopters. There are, are several at McMurdo and you can just land with these helicopters in all sorts of unusual places. Um, we have uh, landed at a number of research camps to meet the researchers and talk about them, what they do. The congressmen were very interested in these, um, uh, for the most part, very young people doing their explorations, what they were, what they were doing. What's amazing in the Stryosif Desert is the variety of features all carved by ice and wind, but influenced by ancient tectonics, earthquakes and volcanoes and rifts, mountain building over hundreds of millions of years. The dry valleys, as their name says, have very low humidity and they, they lack much snow or ice cover. The mountains are high enough to block seaward flowing ice from the East Antarctic ice sheet from reaching the Ross Sea. The rocks are granites and gneisses. You could see spectacular large scale igneous intrusions. Sandstone caps some of the metamorphic and granitic basement rocks and you see a lot of glacial tills forming moraines. So it's just great to fly over this. One of the most interesting features I've uh, always thought is Blood Falls, so-called because of its color here. It's a red ice fall coming out of this tailored glacier. It results from subglacial microbes. Under the glacier is an isolated marine system with no light and no oxygen and having a high salinity, high chloride, high sulfate, and rich in reduced iron. Bacteria there persist without photosynthesis and cycle iron and sulfur and carbon. These intrude in an apparent falls, as you see right here, into Lake Bonnie ice covered. Having taught astrobiology in the past, I'm pleased to see a number of astrobiologists exploring Antarctica for its microbes. A favorite landing place on the helicopter tour is Bull Pass, shown here and here. This one I actually think looks like Darth Vader. 
The exposures are part of a Ferrar a dolerite sill. Dolerite is a volcanic basalt, and the sill is a tabular layer of magma. This sill resulted from a 180 million year old magma event that caused the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. We'll see another example later. Most obvious is the Tafoni or honeycomb weathered rocks giving the area an otherworldly appearance. Modeling magma flows in Bull Pass uh, by some researchers has led to exploration in Minnesota of all places with the discovery of vast deposits of precious metals. So the research here has far and wide uh, consequences. More dry valley views from helicopters. If you look closely, you can see field camps here. And, and of course, a field camp here at the foot of a glacier. And there's a tiny little field camp here out on a frozen lake. They're in uh, mountain valleys. They're on in the base of glaciers everywhere. Scientists and their students stay there for the summer doing biology, geology, glaciology, and environmental research. And helicopters are what brings in the supplies. People sleep in the tents, the green tent here, the yellow tent here, but the research facilities get nicer accommodations. They have more structural integrity. And here is um, a, um, a movie, and it'll start loud, but I'll quiet it down. And it's loud because it's taken from a helicopter. And uh, so I, it's just my favorite feature in the Dry Valley. So I, I have to show it to you. All right. So this is called the gargoyle by Stum. It was sculpted over 25 million years ago by thermal recycling and wind erosion acting on igneous rocks. The, those craggy features are caused by adjacent crystals like feldspar and peroxine here, which expand and contract differently. The rock is basalt like dolerite, iron and magnesium rich and silicon poor with magma intruding sills and dikes when this was part of the upper continental crust 180 million years ago. The magma event which caused this was extensive reaching from Australia across Antarctica to India and Africa. And they were all part of the Gondwana supercontinent. Uh, the, those wings that you see are the rotor blades from uh, the helicopter. But I just think this is a beautiful feature, so much so that the helicopters always fly around the whole thing for us. Yeah, very, very rugged. All right, my number six feature is the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. Uh, reaching the South Pole is, of course, the objective of many who venture to Antarctica. It's, it's not easy even for us who get as far as McMurdo because of the weather. The weather there can be just completely different. Uh, and it's, it's, if the weather is too poor, to uh, for the plane to land, you know, safely and comfortably, then the uh, the people who monitor the weather just obviously won't let us go there, and so we're held over in McMurdo. And sometimes the holdover is so long that people just return to the states or wherever they come from if they're on a, a VIP trip, for example. Um, but I've been fortunate to get to the South Pole on all four trips. As I said, only the U.S. has a permanent uh, presence there. It's over 900 miles from McMurdo, and you've got the Trans-Antarctic uh, mountain range in between them. Uh, so uh, here are on the top two pictures is a South Pole station then in 1996, and this is me standing in front of it, and now, and you see they're just completely different. This old one, as a result of the study and recommendations that were made, uh, the, it was replaced because as you can see, it's just, just getting buried. You go in through the, the doorways right here and you, that's where you go into. So you're under all this ice and uh, it would gradually cover up the whole thing. So it was dismantled in various parts or in museums in different places. And, uh, and at that time, it was before we had the train that goes between the train of cars uh, that goes between um, McMurdo Overland and South Pole Station. And so everything had to be brought in and taken out by
but with airplanes. So it was, uh, took a very long time for all of this to, to happen. Uh, so the, um, and, and you, you have to remember, it's so cold there when the planes land, they, they actually have to keep their engines running if they're gonna make a return flight that day. Uh, so that the, the fuel doesn't freeze. So our, our trips to the South Pole uh, on these, these VIP congressional trips have been um, just during one, one day's time. We go there, it takes five hours to get there. We spend about the same amount of time there and then we take five hours back. And the weather has to be just perfect. So you take an overnight case to spend the night at the South Pole just in case something uh, happens to change that. So, um, the, the two famous places to take your pictures uh, are at the ceremonial South Pole, and that has the flags of the nations uh, behind it, and at the geographic South Pole, which moves, and because the ice is uh, moving, and so they pick it up every year and move it to a new places, so you get your picture taken there too. Um, only the intrepid stay at the pole and experience the 24 hour darkness of the Antarctic winter. There's a few dozen people who stay there and maintain the, the pole facility itself and the research experiments that need maintaining. There are, there's no other life other than human life at the South Pole. There are no penguins at the pole. Uh, so uh, this new pole was finished in the year 2010. And, uh, and it's on stilts, but the snow and ice is gradually, you know, taking up the flexibility of even the, uh, the stilts to, uh, to lift it up. But it's, it's a fabulous place to visit because of all the, the research facilities. So this was a tweet that happened just um, uh, a, a, a couple weeks ago. Um, in the NSF news, and I, I thought it was just a beautiful picture of the South Pole Station. It was celebrating uh, its uh, birthday of the South Pole Station, which, as I said, was uh, in 2010 uh, uh, that it was completed. So, and it shows the beautiful um, uh, Borealis here and the Milky Way. Um, and just kind of lit up by those uh, features. So my number seventh highlight is science in Antarctica. And um, it's, as you can see from this list, there's just a whole lot of different kinds of science. A lot of it has to do with the earth itself and its, and its atmosphere um, and how that's all changing uh, and has changed over billions of years. So the evolution by studying um, uh, meteorites, you know, and so then you're getting uh, meteorites from a lot of uh, other bodies, including asteroids, um, the moon and Mars, and, um, and rocks and the drilling and the evidence that that shows the movements of the ice sheets. Uh, the new bio species are um, constantly being discovered. The ocean ice interface is very important magnetospheric physics. And of course, my interest as an astrophysicist is in uh, cosmology. And so I want to show you a couple of the facilities as they relate to astronomy, because as I said, my field. Um, so, so these are all at uh, the South Pole uh, Station. So there's some really big facilities, and I think they're doing very important work. There's the Ice Creek Cube uh, Neutrino Observatory up here. And it's, um, the, the observatory is under the ice. It takes up a cubic kilometer and it has all these strings of thousands of photomultipliers. And they, they are meant to detect blue light, Cherenkov light emitted when a neutrino coming from way out there, high energy neutrino is captured by an ice molecule. And it recently, a couple of years ago, detected neutrinos from uh, a, an active galaxy. And here's an artist's conception of what an active galaxy looks like. This is viewed on its side, these big jets. The object that it detected uh, neutrinos coming from is viewed straight on when you're looking straight on through the jet. It's called a blazar. 
And um, it made a, a lot of news. It um, was very important observation because it's the first time that high energy neutrinos have been identified with an astrophysical source. And it's um, partly settled an age-old question that is actually 106 years old of what's the origin of high energy cosmic rays uh, ever since uh, early balloon flights that detected those com cosmic rays. The South Pole Telescopes makes observations of the cosmic microwave background and does galaxy studies. This is a photo of me on the most recent trip in uh, December of 2019, holding up an image of the black hole. I think that most of you saw that famous image that made newspapers all over the world. It's uh, the shadow of a black hole in uh, an active galaxy called M87. And, um, it made uh, the breakthrough of the year in Science Magazine. Was that important? The South Pole Telescope, it turns out, was one of several telescopes distributed worldwide that contributed to this iconic image. So I thought it was worth standing in front of that telescope and uh, showing the image. My number eight highlight is the huts of the early explorers. These are just amazing. The arid uh, air preserves uh, things for centuries, uh, literally. And there are three uh, huts that I've seen of the explorers. The oldest one from the 1902 expedition of Scott, which was right there at McMurdo, uh, it is called his discovery expedition. And this, uh, and, and all there is is just the, the hut itself, not, not really uh, much inside of it. And I actually put this was um, uh, because it was my, my first year at uh, the National Science Foundation. Uh, I put it as my NSF Christmas card, this very picture here. Uh, there was Scott's hut in, from the Terra Nova expedition. Uh, that's shown up here, uh, his famous ill-fated expedition that was at Cape Evans in uh, 1910 to 1913. And these are some of the supplies. I have a million pictures of the supplies inside all of these huts. Um, they, they are so well preserved. You can see um, photos that they had at the time, bedding, dog, the dog houses here are um, uh, Shackleton's dog houses. This is Shackleton's hut at um, Cape Royds from his Nimrod expedition uh, in 1907 to 1909. And here's another picture of that same hut here. You can see at the it's at the, the base here of Mount Erebus. But they they've even found whiskey that's buried under these huts from um, Shackleton's uh, expedition. And uh, they've tried to, uh, in New Zealand, mimic that uh, whiskey and, uh, and sell it. But it, it's just amazing how well preserved. There's even mummified uh, animal carcasses here. Well, Shackleton's hut, it's in an interesting place because it turns out that if you walk across this ice field here, you come to my number nine highlight which is a penguin colony. This is an Adili penguin colony. There are thousands uh, of penguins in it. And we have to sit up, um, up on the rocks above it, obviously, to not disturb the, the penguin colonies here. So we, we, we examine the hut and admire all its um, uh, belongings. And then we go out and we watch uh, the penguins for a while. They're just so different from any other animal. And they're relatively friendly. Uh, as you can see, that so this is this penguin uh, colony here uh, is very very stinky. It's just got the excrement over the ages, and even though it's a dry arid air, there's enough of it that you really smell that. You also see a lot of skua birds, which are constantly trying to steal the eggs. They they eat them and they eat the little chicks too. So the birds and the skuas are frantically uh, fighting all the time. We would sit for a long time on the rocks above the rookery, watching the penguins interact with each other and also travel out to a uh, sea and jump off there. Um, so uh, these penguins here are emperor penguins. 
And the way we found those is with the helicopters, they scout around for them, they fly pretty low to the ground. And when they think it's safe for them to land, namely that uh, the ground is hard enough to land and then let us take um, some uh, photos of the penguins who come about that far up to us. They don't actually come up to us. But I thought it's interesting the sounds that they make. So I wanna show you a little uh, video of the penguins. never lose my fascination for watching the penguins. My 10th highlight is I was surprised and honored at my farewell event in Washington, D.C. last February when I was presented with this plaque. The whole thing is a, a plaque, all the pictures here, which says that the feature in the photo, namely right here, had the name for me. It no, happened to set it on top because I sorted the ones that are inside. Gotcha. Oh, uh, it, it, um, happens to be in the Pleiades range of peaks. The petitioners of this award uh, knew that the Pleiades is a special constellation uh, for me because it's also known as the Seven Sisters and I'm from a family of Seven Sisters. The naming is done by the US Board on Geographic Names Advisory Committee on Antarctic Names. And on my last trip home from Antarctica in December of 2019, the pilots flew over this feature it's out on the, um, past the dry valleys in the icy part to go south uh, so that I could see it from the cockpit. And I didn't know at the time that, that this was here, but, but I know my chief of staff was trying hard to get me to look at this feature. And little did I know that they would um, uh, uh, name that feature. So that I thought was uh, very uh, special and appreciated. So I want to say a few words about science uh, policy um, and refer you to um, an article by Kinnicutt et al. in One Earth uh, magazine, which is a very recent article. And, uh, and it's a, a progress assessment on some of the big questions that were asked by the first Antarctic and Southern Oceans Science Horizon scan in 2014. So this was then uh, five years later. Uh, in order to write this article, which is a very long, deep article, it involved a very wide consultation to develop an international view of the most important future directions in Antarctic research. The, art, the authors art, uh, argue that a commitment to an ambitious and sustained Antarctic research plan going forward is essential. That's really the thesis of their article. And they say that their review summarizes not only what we know, but more importantly, what we don't yet know. And I think it's a call to people who are researchers who want to be researchers on the Earth's planet and its climate disruptions to, um, to investigate these things because we do know a lot, but there's also a lot we don't know. So let me say a few words about this. Antarctica, as we've been saying, is a unique observing platform for basic research into the origin and evolution of the universe. So one of their themes is just that. Uh, because it harbors the magnetic south pole, it's also important for studying phenomena in our atmosphere. Antarctic observations could help discern space weather events resulting from the south pole's coronal mass ejections and teach us a lot about the complex processes in the middle and upper atmosphere. You had a talk a couple of weeks ago about gravitational waves from merging black holes and neutron stars. Well, there are things called gravity waves of a different kind in our atmosphere and study of these gives us insight into how, for example, the polar vortex works. The Antarctic atmosphere and global connections is another theme of this report, namely the effect of the oceans on Western Antarctica, especially the El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon. Cloud prediction is the largest uncertainty here. And um, it, it is really affects the atmospheric models. Then the Southern Ocean stores and transports heat and greenhouse gases as it's swept northward. 
increasingly melting sea ice from the Western Antarctic ice sheets. And that plays a very important role in driving the circulation of currents. There's incomplete understanding of the processes that influence sea ice distributions. For example, surface waves can drive the breakup of sea ice and destabilize ice shelves. So that's another important thing. Here in, in this figure is the famously studied Thwaites Glacier, which is under the threat of collapse. It happens to be right about here in Antarctica. It's, uh, there, there have been satellite observations which indicate that Antarctica has contributed to sea level rise in recent years, but there's a lot of uncertainty as to how much Antarctica is contributing. It's clear that Western Antarctica's floating ice shelves are thinning and accelerating glacier flow out to the sea and mass loss. Eastern Antarctica too is losing mass as a whole. The authors say that finer scale models are essential to validating predictions of mass loss and sea level rise. And then probing beneath the ice is important to understand the changes in the earth itself, but this is limited by the hostile environment and also by the lack of international cooperation and data uh, incompatibility. It's not so much that the nations don't want to cooperate, it's just that it takes a lot of effort to cooperate. And I've been at Arctic ministerials, for example, where there's a lot of talk about the nations cooperating, and that is the goal of them and to share their data, but there's a lot of work to really make that happen in a, in a good, effective way. It's essential to integrate data from drillings in the nearby ocean and the interior of the continent to get a complete record of past climates. More and more interdisciplinary efforts uh, to integrate all of these efforts are going to be needed to understand geological processes and their impact on the flow of ice in the past and in the present and the future. There are many uncertainties in our knowledge. For example, the geological and glaciological significance of groundwater um, in the continent is unknown. And then life on the precipice is another theme of this report. It's a theme that the authors invoke to describe the challenges of extreme events on the sustainability of biodiversity. Declining penguin columns, uh, colonies are just one example. For uh, an example is the Brunt Ice Shelf, which collapsed in the Weddell Sea. The Weddell Sea is up here, eliminating the habitat for the world's second largest emperor penguin colony. Blood Falls, which I showed you earlier, is an example of microbial communities being discovered. Climate changes are encouraging moss in different places of the continent, and there are invasive species, including the biggest one, humans, with illnesses that carry over to wildlife. All of this needs to be better documented and understood. The authors also talk about the importance of engaging diverse audiences to assess the impact, delivery, and uptake of the work done by their scan of the continent. This is a point that's been well recognized in the Arctic ministerials that I've attended both in the US and in Iceland. So this quote from Kennecutt et al, I think is a very important one. He says that, and it, it, it's just a, an important insight that's gathering momentum now. He says, public engagement with science is changing. Establishing trust in two-way communication is just vital. Research is increasing understanding of the linkages between knowledge, sentiment, and action in science, as well as governance. And those are all important things to think about bringing together. So how to get to Antarctica? Um, there's uh, clearly those ambitious sort of mountaineers who want to climb all seven uh, summits uh, on the different continents. It's interesting to me that Mount Vincent here, which is uh, the highest mountain, as I mentioned earlier, in Antarctica, was first summited uh, in 1966, December 31st, by a um, Los Alamos scientist who belonged to the Los Alamos Mountaineers. At that time, though, he was a graduate student at the University of Washington. 
The entire expedition, which is 10 people, were, were all scientists, well, probably the first and only of that kind. And they got uh, all their logistics was funded by the National Science Foundation. So, but don't go running to the National Science Foundation if you want to do mountaineering. At that time, there had been no geological survey of that mountain range, the Sentinel Mountain Range and the Vincent Mass Mass Massif. But they got um, permission to do that. And so NSF, the Navy at that time, flew them in and uh, then came back for them. And in the meantime, they climbed six summits and all have mountain peaks named for them as a consequence of that trip. So I thought that was an interesting relationship between science and exploration, and also between somebody I know and who have hiked with and his first ascent of, uh, of the, one of the highest, uh, well, certainly the highest summit in Antarctica and one of the summit, some seven summits. Then there's always, uh, you can always join um, with proper credentials, the um, ANSMET program, which is the Antarctic Search for Meteorites. They've found many, uh, something like 20,000 meteorites, uh, mostly from asteroids, but also uh, some from uh, the moon and Mars. Uh, more commonly, you can get a research grant from NASA or NSF uh, to do uh, field work uh, there. Um, you, it, as if you want to be a staff member, uh, you, the NSF contractor is Lidos, and um, they are, um, I assume, uh, guessing, looking for uh, good people who want to, uh, to go there and work. Uh, the most common way of getting there, but also the most expensive, is to go on special trips, mountaineering trips, cruises, tourism. Uh, there's a lot of, um, of uh, ships that go out of South America, uh, namely Ushuaia in Argentina, across the Drake Passage to the peninsula. You don't get to the areas that I've been talking about there, but you do see a lot of wildlife and you can even fly from Punta Arenas. Uh, I, I do want to note that it's very hard to get to the, the South Pole. Um, there aren't regular uh, tourist expeditions, although the uh, South Pole Station has seen uh, a couple from uh, other countries uh, get down there. So I want to close with this slide here, which is the last paragraph of uh, Cherry, um, uh, wonderful uh, book, uh, the, the Worst Journey in the World, um, because he combines um, science and exploration. And he has some um, really interesting things to say. I think of it as a sober meditation on the nature of exploration. For me, it was interesting what Cherry explains in his book is that what drove the Scott expedition in part was science, that, which I didn't know previously, that, that, that this was um, certainly was an adventurous expedition which sought the South Pole, but it also had a lot of science goals. And in this, Cherry says, it differs from Amundsen's South Pole pursuit, which was purely driven by the goal of reaching the pole first. So he's very focused. Cherry says that this singular focus may have resulted in Amundsen's success, as we know there were a lot of external factors, whereas Scott's expedition had so many uh, efforts that it diffused the goal of achieving the pole first. So let me just read a, a couple of words from this um, wonderful paragraph. He says, there are many reasons which send men to the poles, but the desire for knowledge for its own sake is the one which really counts. And there's no field for collection of knowledge which at present time can be compared to the Antarctic. If you have the desire for knowledge and the power to give it physical expression, go out and explore. And then he says this kind of haunting line, given what I told you about the significance of this egg. If you march your winter journeys, you will have your reward, so long as all you want is a penguin's egg. So the fragile nature of adventure, its goals, its rewards, its sacrifice, its unpredictable twists and turns, reflect the ephemeral nature of the changing Antarctic itself. Thank you. So, so thank you very much. That was an outstanding talk. 
I hope there's time for a few questions. I'm going to ask a very simple one to start it off, though. Um, with the South Pole, with, with uh, Antarctica being at the South Pole, it has all of the lines of longitude, which means it presumably has all time zones. But I'm rather doubtful that there are really 24 time zones there. Um, there must be a few time zones, though. So what time is it at McMurdo and South Pole Station? It's, it's New Zealand time. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, that's what it is at McMurdo. I think every station probably keeps to its own country's uh, time. Okay. Are there other people who have questions? If you have a question, raise your hand in the participant window. There must be a participant window. Um, oh, Ninad, what's your question? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Cordova, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I have a question about the neutron laboratory uh, present in the Antarctica. Neutrino, the neutrino yeah. laboratory? Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. yeah. So uh, I saw an image on uh, your slide number 25, uh, and I did not quite understand what that image was. Uh, was that image from a supernova, or I, I don't understand that image. So I just wanted to. Okay. Um, this this was on the facilities one, was it? Yeah, uh, slide number 25. Yeah, yeah that okay. one. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. So I had. I had the picture of the, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to screen share, so I'll just describe it, but I have it on my other, I have lots of screens here. So, um, so there was the, the top picture was of the observatory, the, the top of the observatory, and then the whole works are underneath the ice. And then there was an artist's illustration of a galaxy. That picture that you saw was of uh, a giant galaxy um, like uh, ours, only a lot more active with a much bigger black hole in the middle of it that has jets coming out of it. And what this, um, this observation, this unique observation that was made a couple of years, two years ago now, was that they, they were able to locate uh, uh, an area of space where the neutrinos were coming from, and then satellites which were operating at the same time, in particular the Fermi gamma ray satellite, was able to then pinpoint that there was some uh, big event happening at this uh, at a particular galaxy that looked like this galaxy, this galaxy. Um, and so they were able to, for the first time, identify that the source of high energy neutrinos is from an active galaxy by having um, multiple uh, observing platforms in space and on the ground. And so, so that was a, a, a very, very special observation to finally get to pinpoint the origin of these neutrinos. Because the observatory itself can just um, guess at a large, uh, approximate a large area of the sky that the neutrinos could be coming from. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your interest. More questions? Are you, you are getting some in the chat window. You're getting, thank you for the fascinating talk, amazing, inspiring talk. You're getting comments like that. So Rita, I've got a question. To do. Okay, Catherine Zodro, what question do you have? So I have um, I have kind of also a, a similar question, right? But I'm, I'm really curious. So how much is um, travel, once you get to Antarctica, how much is travel around the continent kind of like, regulated like can you just go for a walk can you just you know like or well, do you need permits it's kind of kind of su super regulated but um so so it depends on who you are and who you're with um i can imagine i've never gone on one of those cruises but i'm really trying to talk my spouse into <laughs> i want to go across the drake passage i know Beth does not want to do that but i like the rough and tumble and i want to go across and um and uh, but i don't know i i can imagine that the ships 
they're, they're supposed to take care of you. I've been on a lot of cruises to other places and they don't, they don't let you much out of their sight. But now and at McMurdo, so say you're um, a, a scientist or staff person, they, they have a modicum of freedom. I mean, we got to, uh, for example, we, we were with a, a mountaineering kind of guide, uh, but we, we were allowed to go skiing and they had skis at the, um, they have a sports chalet and they've got all sorts of equipment in it. And we were allowed to do a little, you know, hiking up the rock. And, and of course, we've always done an observation hill. We just do alone. And I, I think that, you know, during some of the times I've done that, I've been, I've been afraid. And there's, there's kind of a big photo that I have of me and the head of Noah giving each other a big hug after we made it to the summit because we were almost blown off that thing in December of 2019. So they let you run around McMurdo in the local environment, um, but. Um, if you, if you want to venture out. Now we have had, I didn't talk about it because it's depressing, but there, there have been accidents and there, and even during my six year tenure as NSF director deaths in Antarctica. And so, so safety is, is a very, very big deal. And, um, and uh, we, there are all sorts of, you know, as you can imagine, lots of lots of rules and regulations. The inspector general comes down there with her small team every couple of years to check on all sorts of things there to make sure it's all ship shape. Every time there's an accident, of course, there's a huge review and there are more uh, rules. And so, um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's not a, an easy place, uh, but, but that said, the, the people who stay there, like who summer over um, in, in the winter, you don't go anywhere, but in the summer, you know, they have, they have a lot of fun. They have these ultra marathons that they do. They have these, um, these things they do in Sweden where you get very, very hot and then you get very cold and dunk yourself in these ice tubs. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I so we that. got a question in the in the chat that said, "Was that the only observation or confirmation of neutrinos detected? How many total?" Thank you. Very interesting talk. This is from Rick. Yeah. Um, so I I haven't brushed up on my my neutrino uh, observations lately. It was unique in identifying neutrinos, ultra high neutrinos. Um, and thus cosmic rays with with a source. And I don't think that there's been anything done like that since it's very hard to detect. They've detected, of course, neutrinos from the sun and all. And there are um, uh, observations of neutrinos that they don't know where they came from. Um, they are uh, presently wanting to upgrade the uh, proposal in, or they're working on proposal, the, uh, the whole international team of people to upgrade the facility to be able to be more sensitive to neutrinos. But no, I don't think that they're discovering lots of them. I think it would be um, just interesting for the um, inquirer to go um, online and see what the latest observations are. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just not aware. So, so, so tell them the name of that facility because then they can go online. And, yes, Ice um, Cube. Ice Cube. Ice Cube. Yeah, one word. One word. One word. Ice Cube. Okay, and it's it's headquartered at Wisconsin, at University yeah. of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you Google there, they'll take you all sorts of other places to look at um, relevant articles. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, the final question came in through the chat and it's from Eva Andrada. Uh, she says, great talk. I have one question. This is a sort of a complicated question. In high temperatures, the water rock interaction increases at higher temperatures. In this case, the water rock ice water interaction with rocks, H how is it? The minerals, are, are the minerals changing while decreasing temperature? I mean, so obviously at the base of the ice where there's all this water, there's certainly cold water rock interactions and some grinding. Yeah, I, I would turn that question just right over to you, the geologist, Bev. Um, I'm not the geologist. I'm a geophysicist, I'm, remember? Yes, I'm an, yes, but that, that has some physics in it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm an astrophysicist. So I don't know the details of that. If she wants to send me her question, um, on the, the last time I talked by Antarctica, we had the, the Antarctic uh, geologist um, just decided to join the, the conversation. And uh, I can shoot your question. Uh, over to him, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting question, but I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't attempt to, uh, to uh, answer it. Thank you. 
So, uh, thank you. I'm going to try to, I don't know if I can unmute all, uh, I can unmute all or something. Anyway, we can either do those little icons at the bottom, to clap or actually clap with our loudspeakers off. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. And thank you for, for coming to Butte during an Antarctic week. <laughs> thank you very much for inviting me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, goodbye, everyone. Bye.